Right. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome uh, to this, the 27th meeting in 2014 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism uh, Committee. Can I welcome members, uh, welcome uh, our witnesses and uh, welcome uh, visitors in the public uh, gallery uh, this morning. And can I remind everyone, please, to turn off or at least turn to silent uh, all uh, mobile phones and other uh, electronic devices so they don't interfere with the uh, sound equipment. Um, we have apologies from uh, Joan McAlpin, who's running late, but should be joining us uh, shortly. And I know Mr. Brody needs to leave um, about uh, half past 11 or shortly before to go to another uh, committee. Uh, item one uh, on the agenda, um, are members content that we take item three in private? Agreed. That's agreed. Thank you. <coughs> item two on the, the agenda, we are continuing our draft budget scrutiny for 2015-16. Uh, and I'd like to welcome uh, this morning to give evidence uh, John Swinney, who's the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth, who's joined this morning by John Mason, uh, Director of Business, and Mary McCallum, Director of Energy and Climate Change at the Scottish Government. Welcome uh, to you all. Uh, before we get into questions, Mr Swinney, do you want to say something by way of an opening statement? Uh, thank you very much, Kavina, and uh, I welcome the opportunity to discuss the 2015-16 draft budget with the committee this morning. Our approach is founded in the Government's economic strategy with the objective of delivering opportunities for all of Scotland to flourish through increasing Scotland's economic uh, growth performance. The uh, Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth Portfolio will continue to encourage entrepreneurship, innovation and internationalisation and to offer the most competitive business rates regime in the United Kingdom through the Small Business Bonus Scheme as part of the budget proposals. Uh, Scotland's businesses are key to the long-term success of the Scottish economy. We will continue to support our enterprise agencies who will provide targeted support to encourage growth and improvement. Uh, the committee's focus for 2015-16 uh, budget scrutiny is um, focused in, in one respect on exports. The Scottish Government has set an ambitious goal of increasing exports by 50% by 2017. In support of this target, the Government, through Scottish Enterprise and SDI, will launch two new international trade initiatives early in 2015. The High Growth Market Unit, which aims to accelerate international sales in China, India and the Middle East through enhanced support for companies with the potential and the desire to sell into these harder to enter but high opportunity markets. And secondly, through the Scots Exporter Initiative, which will focus on encouraging and helping non-exporters to start exporting and helping early stage and occasional exporters to grow uh, overseas sales. Um, this will be open to all companies. A range of products and services will be made available to help them prepare for and achieve export sales. Um, we also need to develop the, the skills base and increase the number of companies that are exporting and SDI is working effectively with companies to raise their ambition levels uh, and to achieve their full potential in relation to export activities. Since 2011, over 6,400 Scottish companies have benefited from export events and services through initiatives such as the Smart Exporter. Then one of the other crucial um, areas of focus will be on uh, connectivity. Air connectivity is important for Scotland's global competitiveness in order to secure economic recovery and sustainable economic growth. And our economic strategy um, highlights the opportunities and the importance of international air connectivity uh, to support this effort. This is what will be taken forward in partnership between Visit Scotland, Scottish Enterprise, Hands Arms Enterprise and Transport Scotland. Um, alongside the work on exports, the committee has also um, highlighted um, areas of interest in relation to the low carbon economy and in relation to energy and fuel poverty. Um, the government has a, a comprehensive range of interventions in relation to the low carbon economy including investing £2.2 .2 million pounds over 2014-15 and 15-16 in the offshore wind accelerator programme, supporting local renewable energy projects and uh, uh, the deployment of wave and tidal array projects through the, the Renewable Energy Investment Fund, and putting in place a, lo a local energy innovation challenge fund worth up to £20 million pound to test communities' capacities to stabilise and reduce energy costs by reducing dependence on centralised generation and capacity. Um, we believe that a more comprehensive and fairer service for those vul vulnerable to fuel poverty can be provided with a properly uh, planned and funded government service working with delivery partners, which is our approach through the Home Energy Efficiency Programmes for Scotland. And between 2009-10 and 2012-13, the Scottish Government invested 
uh, £220 million on a range of uh, fuel, energy, uh, fuel poverty and energy efficiency programmes. Um, this is a, a brief summary convener, of some of the priorities in the Government's uh, budget, but I look forward to answering questions from the Committee. Uh, thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary, for that uh, introduction. Um, we've got about uh, 90 minutes or so uh, for the session. Uh, and what I, I propose doing is trying to cover um, the three main topics in turn, starting with uh, uh, energy and fuel poverty, uh, then uh, enterprise and exports, and then finally uh, tourism, uh, and try and uh, group uh, the discussion, if we can, around those, those broad uh, topics. Um, and I would remind members, uh, if they would, to keep their uh, questions uh, as short and to the point uh, as possible. And similarly, uh, answers that are as uh, short and to the point would, would be helpful in getting through the uh, subjects in the time available. Can, can I maybe start off then on the, the energy and fuel poverty uh, part of your brief, uh, Cabinet Secretary? Uh, this was an, an issue we took some evidence on um, two weeks ago from Energy Action Scotland and uh, WWF. Uh, Scotland. The um, Scottish Government has a statutory target to eradicate fuel poverty as far as reasonably practical by November uh, 2016. Is the Scottish Government still committed to that target? Yes, we are. Yeah. Have you made any assessment of what is the uh, likely cost of uh, that target being met? The I think that's a difficult number to estimate, Convener, because it will involve um, a variety of different interventions, some of which will be supported by governments, uh, the government's public expenditure programme, but some also will be supported by the commitments and the participation that um, energy companies make to uh, that whole proposition. Um, uh, what, I, what I do think is the case is that uh, strong progress has been made given the sustained investment the government has made and the sustained contribution that's been made by energy companies into the bargain. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, when when you know, we put similar questions to Energy Action Scotland and WWF uh, about whether they believed that the budget allocation for the uh, coming year would be sufficient, bearing in mind this was the last full year before the uh, date that the uh, target would need to be met, uh, as to whether the budget allocation would be sufficient, they were quite clear that they did not feel the sums allocated by the Scottish Government would allow that target uh, to be met. Um, why do you think they're wrong? I think that if I look at the... Um, I think it just depends the way you look at this, this whole issue. Um, as I understand it, the, um, the type of sum of money that was being talked about by the... Uh, by Energy Action Scotland and by WWF was um, of the order of £200 million per annum, if uh, if my recollection is correct. I, I saw the number earlier on this morning, but I've, it's escaping me just now. But I think it was of the order of uh, uh, £200 million. Um, When you look at the variety of different interventions that are taken forward by the government, and then also what could be a reasonable expectation of what would also be contributed through um, some of the commitments that are required by the energy companies, because I do think it's essential that um, both of these elements are taken together. Um, I think it would be reasonable to conclude that the combination of the, um, the Home Energy Efficiency Programme for Scotland investment, the Warm Homes Fund, the Green Homes Cash Back, um, we deliver investment well in excess of £200 million. For 1314, I think a reasonable estimate of that would probably be about £260 million. So I think um, looking at all of these um, different sources of funds in the round, I think they probably contribute the type of sums of money that the organisations like Energy Action Scotland and WWF were suggesting uh, were of the order of what was required to... to, to deliver on that objective? Yes. Um, when we asked Mr Kerr from Energy Action Scotland about this uh, when he gave evidence, he was clear though that wouldn't be the case. Um, his concern was that the Scottish Government were relying on money coming in, for example, from uh, the eco scheme. But he said a lot of the uh, eco spend money was going on uh, boiler replacement in houses connected to the gas grid. So not actually uh, tackling fuel poverty uh, in areas where it was most extreme. 
Uh, and his concern, therefore, was that to rely on that eco money uh, as part of the sums required uh, meant that we wouldn't be coming close to addressing uh, the target. I think there's a um, well, obviously, you know, Mr. Kerr is a uh, is a uh, an experienced commentator and advisor on these these questions, and it's important to to to, to listen and to reflect on the the points that he's advanced. I think what what we're confident about is that we have put in place um, very clear dialogue, much better dialogue than has ever been in existence before between the Scottish Government and relevant interested parties and the energy companies to make sure that we are actually operating in a seamless fashion, that we've got a combined proposition that is aimed at tackling fuel poverty. Um, and that, that's why I, I kind of vest my answers on that combination of different areas of expenditure that are emerging because we, we have put in such efforts to try to ensure that our dialogue with the, 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 the energy companies is such that we are encouraging them to spend uh, and to support interventions that directly address that um, the necessity to tackle fuel poverty. Um, but obviously, you know, we'll be happy to um, reflect further on uh, the advice that Mr Kerr has offered um, to see if there is any way in which we can uh, further strengthen the focus and the effectiveness of that expenditure. Okay, thanks. I've got other members who want to come in. So one, one more question that I just want to ask on this. The, the, the fuel poverty target is a statutory target. What, what will happen if it's not met by November 2016? Um, well, I, 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 I dare say there will be, um, be some significant parliamentary scrutiny around uh, such, a, such an issue uh, if, 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 that, uh, if that unfortunately happens. But legally, given it's a legal target, what is the, what is the consequence? Um, I, 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 well, I, I, well, I think the government, the, the, the legal consequences, the government will have to explain itself to Parliament. Right. Okay, thanks. Okay, I've got other members who want to come in. Margaret McDougall, I think, wants to come in. Thank you, convener, and good morning. Good morning. Cabinet Secretary. Um, just to continue on the fuel poverty theme and, you know, the energy, the Energy Action Scotland evidence that we heard, I mean, Norman Kerr stated that a full cost analysis is necessary to determine whether the current budget to eradicate fuel poverty is fit for the purpose. Does the Scottish Government have any intention to carry out such a well, no. essentially, what we've what we've we've done in the process of the budget is identify the resources that um, we consider um, are required to work in concert, as I've explained to the convener, with the streams of expenditure that are emerging from um, uh, other sources, and to work in a in a, in, a in a collaborative way to ensure that those monies are used um, effectively um, together. So uh, I, I think the, the, the question of, um, I think a lot of time could be deployed trying to put together um, the type of comprehensive assessment that Mr Kerr is talking about when in fact we know from the available data the, the significant challenge that we face in, in eradicating fuel poverty. Um, so the importance of ensuring that we have clear alignment between the uh, different streams of expenditure is, um, in my view, a vital priority in trying to um, advance the practical activity that's required mm -hmm. uh, to tackle this issue. So there's no intention to carry out an analysis uh, report? On we, certainly, we, we, we certainly um, uh, have no plans to prepare that type of analysis, what we're concentrating on is delivering the practical steps and interventions to tackle fuel poverty where we're able to do so. I mean, a lot of work has been done around uh, fuel inefficiencies uh, and energy efficiency in the social rented sector, but the private rented sector is falling way behind. So what is the Scottish Government going to do to further improve the efficiencies in the private sector because it would seem that we've we've reached a a flat where there's nothing else being done and they're not improving on that so should we have legislated in the 
recent Housing Act, for example? I think the, the yeah, you know, I, I, I wouldn't accept the premise that um, that we've flatlined on that point because there are, you know, very significant levels of investment available to support householders in the private sector to um, to tackle issues of uh, energy inefficiency and fuel poverty, um, and I think if I look back over the years in which we've wrestled with these these, these questions, sometimes. Um, the feedback from energy companies, for example, has been of the difficulty in actually engaging um, householders in some of these questions. And one of the points that I accepted a number of years ago, it's a suggestion made by, by, by the Green Party, was the importance of um, local, um, comprehensive local schemes, area-based schemes been taken forward to try to capture exactly the type of um, individuals and householders that um, uh, that Mr. McDougall talks about, and I think in that respect, um, the area-based schemes has been, which has been something that we've we've maintained, which has not been maintained south of the border, which we believe is an important tool in trying to undertake that activity. And in the period um, since um, 2008, more than 600 ho 600,000 homes in Scotland have received energy efficiency measures according to the information that we have available to us. So it's a, a pretty comprehensive start has been made um, in uh, assisting individuals and that's of the ones that we are aware of. That's you know beyond what other individuals and householders will be taking forward under their own steam as part of their, you know, their, 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 their wider home um, uh -huh. improvement work. So... Um the private sector as a whole, you know, there has been some improvement in uh, energy efficiency, but where there's private rented sector in particular, there seems to be an issue where landlords perhaps are not taking up the options that are out there to them. Um, I, I, I've not seen, I've not seen um, specific data on that point, but I'll certainly explore that point. Um, and if it is the case that there is a particular weakness within the private rented sector in actually taking these steps which would assist in uh, addressing the difficulties that uh, individuals who are experiencing fuel poverty are suffering, then, then obviously we can refine the, um, the focus of our intervention to try to address that um, uh, once we've considered that point. Thanks for that. Now, if I have another question on um, district heating, which is another area where um, it would appear that perhaps we're not performing as well as we should be and that companies are not taking up this opportunity um, because the target, I believe, is 40,000 homes by 2020 should be benefiting from district heating. So and we're currently at 10,000 homes. So, um, I mean, WWF have said that it's important that it is complemented by real substantive efforts on a regulatory framework that could both protect the consumer through the provision of district heating and incentivise the and create a market. So what more can the Scottish Government be doing to help this uh, market increase because we just don't seem to be moving forward enough on that? Well, there's a couple of things that, 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 that are relevant in the budget. Um, the low carbon economy budget has increased by 17.3% um, from 6.4 million to 7.5 million. And there are two particular initiatives in there which we think will assist in, in this area of activity. Uh, one is the commitment of an additional uh, 4 million pounds for the district heating loan scheme, which um, will exist over period 2014 to 2016 obviously we don't have budget information beyond 2016 but it, it's a you know recognizing the point that Mr. McDougall makes about the importance of tackling this issue up to 2020 there is a necessity to ensure that there is a, 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 a sustainable budget line to address this uh, over those years um, and in the current financial year we've also enhanced our home renewables loan scheme um, with an additional £4 million, which is designed to support householders to take up um, different opportunities to um, 
embark on the renewable heat incentive scheme. So th 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 there's a, a number of different areas where we are taking practical steps to support um, district heating activity and, um, and, and we'll continue to sustain those uh, initiatives in the years to come. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Mike McKenzie. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet and Secretary. Um, I'm sure you'd be gratified to know that Norman Kerr, when he gave evidence to the committee, was very complimentary about the Scottish Government report and drew a comparison with other uh, nations of the UK um, and uh, indicated strongly that Scotland, Scotland's general approach to fuel poverty was, was a much better approach. Um, I wonder if you agree, though, with... Um, the sentiment they expressed that um, it, to the extent to which um, Scottish government funding is designed to be complementary to UK initiatives and funding streams, that the uncertainty that uh, seemed to prevail with the UK funding streams made it very difficult for the Scottish government to design complementary schemes, particularly in um, the rural areas, I think one of our committee members mentioned that off-gas grid uh, measures are particularly difficult to implement, present significant challenges, and that the UK Eco, for instance, doesn't do well in, in rural areas where, where those kind of uh, off-gas grid and, uh, and hard-to-treat property issues prevail. Um, I think this... Uh the point of principle that I would I'd make here is that I think people would be surprised if the Scottish Government, under the current constitutional arrangements, did not try to act in a complementary fashion to what the UK Government is proposing. If we were to act in a, a duplicating fashion, then I think it would take a kind of, you know, an awful lot of explanation as to why we're using scarce public resources in a fashion that was in any other um, a fashion complementary to what the UK um, approach was designed to do. I think one of the challenges has been is that this has been an area of, um, well, let me be charitable, evolution within the UK government, and we've we've essentially had to await details of the uh, the, the final design of the eco scheme. And of course, you know, to go back to my answers to the the, the convener a moment ago. Um, our ambitions of what we want to achieve you know, do require an element of effectiveness from our expenditure, but also effectiveness from the UK government's expenditure and the investment of the, the power companies into the bargain. So we have to see all that joined up. And as I said in my other answers, we've put a, a lot of effort into trying to ensure that is joined up and effective in that respect. Um, so... Uh, Certainly, designing initiatives that are complementary, that work in a fashion that is supportive of each other, that assists the wider policy objective of tackling fuel poverty, that is exactly the, the, the hallmarks of how the Scottish Government would go about its um, exercising its responsibilities in this respect. Another point that uh, Norman Kerr uh, made, I think, uh, raised some eyebrows in the committee, but um, was that... Uh, some of the Scottish Government funding, uh, the, the, the HEAPS funding, um, that uh, he was expressing disappointment that a, a, a fair number of local authorities, and I think he wasn't uh, keen to mention them by name and single them out, but um, some of them at least had spent none of the first <coughs> year's allocation um, and were struggling to actually you know, implement implement schemes and, and spend the money so that the Scottish Government had made that money available, um, but because councils perhaps weren't ready to implement schemes, uh, you know, the action on the ground hadn't been taken and the money hadn't been spent, but it did complement the Scottish Government on um, the showing a degree of flexibility and allowing them to carry over that funding to following years. Um, would you agree with Norman Kerr's analysis? And I just wonder, is there more that can be done to assist councils to or encourage them to get, you know, that money uh, out there, you know, tackling fuel poverty? I, I'm certainly advised by local authorities that they will fully spend their budget allocation for 2013-14. Um, and um, that would be my expectation and um, 
60 million of area-based expenditure has been allocated to all 32 local authorities on the 4th of June. Um, and that includes significant investment for the more remote, remote parts of Scotland, of which, with which Mr Mackenzie will be very familiar. Um, so I, I, I can't see um, any reason why there would be any justification for local authorities being unable to spend the resources that have been allocated to them. It's clearly in the interests of householders and, um, and, and constituents within local authority areas. And um, certainly I, I'm, I'm assured by the information I've been given that uh, local authorities uh, have spent their full allocation for 13-14, um, but we will maintain our dialogue with local government to make sure that that uh, continues during this financial year. Thank you. Okay, Margaret McDougall wanted to come in briefly. On, on the heap, some of the evidence that we received was that not all local authorities' areas have energy efficiency officers. And it would seem that the authorities who have energy efficiency officers do perform better. I think the, I think the key question here is about how... I think the question we have to answer here is how is information disseminated and how is activity taken forward to make sure that um, energy efficiency measures are taken forward? If I think of my own constituency, for example, um, the, uh, th there's an energy saving social enterprise um, being created and in, in, um, uh, supported by some climate challenge fund money, money from the government um, based in the town of Cooper Angus. Um, it's a locally based initiative. It is um, embedded in the community. It's essentially providing advice in a very, very accessible fashion, if I may say so, more accessible than normally would be provided by Perth and Kinross Council. It's right in the heart of the of the town. So I don't think we should just make a judgment that the only way we can deliver this type of activity is if we've got a local authority employee that leads the process. Part of the government's agenda <coughs> excuse me, on public service reform <coughs> is to motivate the participation of a wide range of different providers, including third sector organisations, who I think, as, as Mrs McDougall will know from her own experience, are fabulously well connected with local communities to try to encourage participation. So I, I, wouldn't, I would caution against believing that we, we have to have a, a designated local authority officer in place. I would certainly say there has to be very clear and effective um, a delivery and encouragement mechanisms in place in localities. But if that happens to be delivered by a third sector organisation, then I think as long as it's effective, I think we should be content with that. Mm. But the, I mean, the issue around these locally based uh, organisations is <coughs> that perhaps they're not covering the whole local authority. They, 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 they may well not be covering the entire local authority, but what, what I'm saying is that um, just simply the existence of, you know, one energy efficiency officer for a local authority doesn't, I think, give us satisfactory information or reassurance that all that can be done is being done to try to promote and to encourage energy efficiency and to give practical advice to individuals. I think we've got to make sure that's the key question that has to be has to be answered. Is it practical and possible for members of the public? If I think about my own circumstances. You know, I put off getting cavity wall insulation in my house because it was just, you know, too hard to do, too difficult, blah, blah, blah. And I went along to an energy efficiency fair one day, met one local charity with one phone call. The assessment was done at my house and then the work was done. So it was a great deal easier than I thought it was going to be. But, you know, I even overcome, overcame my own um, uh, obstructive laziness on these questions. And... Um, so, but it's about, is the information available to people? Is it provided in a fashion that is accessible to people? And it's therefore, I think, more likely that people will make the commitment to undertake these steps. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, Alison Johnson. Thank you, Convener. Um, on Friday morning, I was in Abbey Moore at Energy Action Scotland's annual conference, and I took part in, in a debate, and obviously the, the hall was full of, of experts from across the country. And I think it's fair to say they're very supportive of WWF's call that retrofitting energy efficiency measures become a national infrastructure priority and they were pointing out that there are three and a half thousand jobs in the short term perhaps nine thousand jobs in this industry by 2027 if we're serious about 
you know, modern apprenticeships in this area, becoming really expert at treating the hard to treat houses that we have. Does, does the Scottish Government support such a call that this is seen as a national infrastructure priority? I think that I, I would support that. I think it's a, um, I think over the, the, the years that we've discussed these issues, I would be the first to concede that um, the hard to reach properties, the retrofitting work is by far the greater challenge than applying um, state of the art energy efficiency measures to new build properties. It's a completely different proposition. Um, so, so yes, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to uh, to that point. I think it's also the way in which Alison Johnson's expressed it is interesting because it also demonstrates that there is an economic benefit to be had, and there's also a skills and development opportunity for um, for, for for young people through the modern apprenticeship activities. So, and, and by expressing it in that fashion. It, le it relates to other areas of the government's activity where we can identify um, how other uh, elements of public expenditure on modern apprenticeships, for example, can be used to support a wider programme of housing improvement, which will bring energy efficiency benefits, but will also bring economic benefits in the short term into the bargain. Okay, thank you. Um, that's, that's very heartening. There was a there was a, a representative from the Western Isles Council, and I think he pointed out that fuel poverty there can reach as high as 71% of homes. So there are obviously specific challenges in particular areas, and they were calling for, for more attention to be given to those areas as a matter of, of urgency. One of the points the convener made to me earlier on that uh, Mr Kerr had made is something which I think we need to be very mindful of, is the degree to which... Um, the ever hard to reach, if I can use that terminology, of perhaps I think the most acute example of some of the aspects of fuel poverty will be likely to be in the Western Isles. So we have to be mindful and test as to whether or not we are doing the, you know, the, the wider steps that we are taking to tackle fuel poverty are actually reaching the ever hard to reach areas in as effective a way as we possibly can do. And I think Mr Mackenzie also made the point about um, the off-gas grid challenge, which is a particularly acute challenge in many areas of rural Scotland, is, is a particular priority. Um, in the, the report that we received last night, um, for 2015 to 16, the uh, draft budget funding for the Warm Homes Fund is yet to be confirmed. Do we know when we'll have more information? Um, that... I expect that to be done fairly shortly. I can't give the committee a, a precise date as to when that will be, but um, again, it'll be taken. The decisions will be taken there, um, mindful of the need to complement wider programmes that are taken forward as part of the, the fuel poverty measures. Okay. Uh, but I'd also say it'll be, it will be the decisions will be undertaken and communicated in adequate time to ensure the money can be uh, wisely spent in the course of 15-16. We, we received this information, you know, the the, um, the funding for climate change mitigation measures last night at 4.30. I'm just wondering if it would be at all possible in future years to have that information earlier. I realise that, uh, you know, officers are, are waiting on other information in order to get this together, but I'm just wondering if that's a possibility. We'll, we'll certainly endeavour to do that. I, I, I wasn't aware there was a, a problem with time, so certainly when I cleared the information to, to come, it's only within the last... Just trying to think when I cleared that information to come. I think it may have just been may have just been on Monday. I think, but I'd, I'd have to check that absolutely. But the um, I, I didn't realise it was a problem. I obviously will endeavour to get that. But we've got the level four information to committees um, much earlier than habitually has been the case. Um, but obviously the climate the the, the climate change mitigation a. Uh, Profile of the budget. Essentially, what we're, you know, we have a commitment to the Finance Committee to present the budget largely in the format of the Blue Book. Um, I quite appreciate that other committees have a slightly different way that they want to look at this information, and we then have to recalibrate and recalculate that um, alongside the Level 4 information. So I'll certainly uh, endeavour to ensure that that's provided timidly to the committee. Could I ask one more question? Um, the fossil fuel levy budget line has been significantly reduced and reprofiled, but 
Um, I'm just wondering if we have any information on what the plans are for this budget. Can we expect to see an increase in later years? And I suppose specifically, where is the £20 million of previously committed funding being reallocated to? Well, essentially, the, the, you know, where I make a um, this goes into the, the kind of wider management of the, the budget issues. Um, I, I will go through. I go through a process with all portfolios, including my own, um, and a, a, of exploring whether or not um, previous plans are appropriate and uh, capable of being delivered. Um, as we, you know, so obviously we set out twelve months ago the draft plans for fifteen sixteen. And um, I would be testing, as well, I have tested during the budget process, were those plans still capable of being delivered and were they the most appropriate uses of the resources um, or were there other areas of activity that may have a, a higher call um, on, on, on those resources. Um, on the Renewable Energy Investment Fund, f particularly, um, the my assessment of the likely pipeline of projects was such that it wouldn't be, I wasn't confident that the £20 million would be, um, would be required to be delivered given the pipeline of projects that had emerged. And I think the, the, the basic factor that we've wrestled with here is that there is, um, there's been a lot of market uncertainty about renewable energy developments created by the electricity market reform process that's been taken forward within the United Kingdom. That has undoubtedly slowed up um, emerging developments that I would have expected to see coming forward. So my judgment was, based on the uh, available pipeline information, that we we would probably be unable to spend that £20 million. So it's been reallocated to other priorities within the budget. However, the fossil fuel levy generated... £103 million for the Scottish budget. We have an obligation to spend £103 million on projects that would qualify under the Renewable Energy Investment Fund. We will do we, we will do that, but we will do it over a longer time frame than was originally envisaged. And I, I certainly give the commitment to the, the committee today that the obligation that I accepted um, uh, around the fossil fuel levy resources of £103 million has been spent uh, on relevant commitments in that environment will be spent, but over a longer time frame. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to come in with follow-ups? We'll start with Richard Baker. Just very briefly, the, the, the uh, submission we've had from the existing Homes Alliance Scotland um, talks about you know, vagueness in the um, draft budget uh, about how additional um, funds will be levered in. Uh, and, you know, and given the, the funding that's coming from the Scottish Government at the moment, £79 million, and given just how far off we are at the moment from the 2016 target uh, being reached, I mean, on your current plans in the budget, we haven't got a cat in hell's chance of making that target, have we? And why isn't there a more significant response from that from Government? Parliamentary language, Mr. Baker. But oh, yeah. I apologise. Yeah, well, it's pretty. I think we have to all hell. <laughs> I think it's maybe just a bit kind of fruity for a Wednesday morning, uh, even from Mr. Baker. Um, uh, you know, l let's just let's just take apart the the, the fruity sentences. Um, you know, Mr. Baker um, suggested there wasn't sufficient definition in um, what we expected to be leveraged in. Well, I, I've already told the committee that in 2013-14, we you know we assess that about £170 million was deployed by energy companies under ECO um, into, the, um, into energy efficiency in Scotland. Um, you know, adding to the commitments the Scottish Government has made, that makes a total investment of over £260 million. Now, you know, I, I know Mr Baker is very carefree with public expenditure and wider expenditure, but £260 million is one heck of an amount of public expenditure and uh, private investment in fuel poverty measures. And given that the existing Homes Alliance um, have said that, um, well, the, 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 they were calling for the fuel poverty measure to, to be increased from 79 million to 125 million pounds, 
and I've said that £260 million was spent in 2013-14. I think the government's living up to what's required in this area. Ms. Lyons, which talked about vagueness in your statement in terms of the mm. funding of the Ivory but I think I've made my point convenient. Have a fruitly. Thank you. Less fruit, please. <laughs> Mr. McKenzie. Thank you, Convener. I just uh, thought I would pick up, it seems to me almost in what you've been saying about energy market reform, the uncertainty uh, leading to a slowdown, and we hope it's only a slowdown in uh, renewable energy projects and investment, that, that almost seemed to be analogous to the points I was trying to make. But I, I just wonder how that and also other unfortunate market signals that the UK government has sent, things like uh, solar PV, feed-in tariffs been reduced drastically in a very short period of time and the prevarication and the inordinate length of time that it took to bring forward the, the domestic re renewable heat incentive um, insofar as Scottish government funding is designed to be complementary and that some there's a crossover between you know renewable energy and fuel poverty um, some community projects using profits from renewable energy to mitigate fuel poverty in their areas and so on and so forth this kind of theme of the difficulty of designing um, funding streams from the Scottish Government that work well, um, given the uncertainties stemming arising from UK Government, that must create difficulties. I think the, 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 the renewable energy projects point is, is, is I think, a, is a valid uh, comparison here. Um, you know, I think any dispassionate observer, and I'm trying to be as dispassionate as I can be this morning, um, that would say that there has been a hiatus in investment created by the discussion around electricity market reform. It's taken longer it's, uh, than, than was envisaged. Um, it has involved um, um, a, a, you know, a great deal of uncertainty for the marketplace. And if I think about my own conversations, I've had conversations with inward investors, for example, who were, um, 2012, were very, very close to making decisions about uh, possible investments in renewable energy within Scotland. But 12 months later, their interest was much less significant and much less timely because they felt they had less clarity about electricity market reform than when we were having our conversation in 2012. So I think there's a, so the, 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 there is clearly a challenge here and obviously a challenge where we want to make sure our money is used in a complementary fashion because I think members will be sufficiently familiar with the approach to public expenditure management that I've taken that I don't, I'm not interested in duplicating expenditure. I'm interested in making sure that expenditure is used wisely and in a focused way to deliver better outcomes for people. Um, if we're not sure what else is coming into the mix from the UK government, it is often difficult for us to plan effectively. So that essentially informs the decision I've made on the reef expenditure for 2015-16 that in the current context my judgment is I don't think £35 million would be required so therefore we can use those resources in other areas of the, of the budget. And, and just w w w w one point I would <coughs> just briefly make that given, you know, w we've heard about Western Isles fuel poverty but we know from recent reports from that fuel poverty is at very high levels in Shetland and again in Orkney and across other parts of the Highlands and Islands. Um, do you share my concern then at the the extra 2p uh, charging for you know on e electricity bills for consumers across the Highlands and Islands, and surely that exacerbates this already difficult situation? Well, well clearly, energy costs are a very significant um, issue for, for 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 all households, but they're 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 an acute um, issue for people in the Highlands and Islands and, um, and, 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 and an ever more acute problem for those who are living in fuel poverty. So um, uh, I understand and sympathise with the concern that Mr Mackenzie raised. Okay. Right, I think we've um, had a good uh, kick of the ball in relation to uh, fuel poverty and energy. I think we should move on to uh, enterprise and exports, part of the portfolio. And I'll bring in Dennis Robertson. Uh, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, <sighs> Scotland has uh, actually enjoyed a very healthy period of investment into Scotland, in fact, record investment within Scotland at the moment. And in your opening remarks, you've set targets for um, our exports and the internalisation um, programme as well. Now, that presents opportunities and challenges. 
What are the challenges in terms of reaching the targets for the export market? There's a number of challenges that will exist there. Um, I think one of them will be about ensuring that we um, motivate and support and enlist a sufficiently broad range of companies in Scotland to participate in uh, the achievement of the export challenge. Uh, that's one. Uh, secondly, will be the <coughs> access to markets, which will be, um, in some cases, will be hard to reach and will require a great deal of support to enter those markets. And obviously, th there are a range of resources at our disposal in international markets to assist that process. Um, and then thirdly, uh, obviously, the, the, the wider economic conditions can be a factor in relation to the achievement of those export challenges. You know, the, the, the weakness of the Eurozone, which represents a very significant export market for Scottish companies, um, is, uh, is an issue with which we have to consider. Um, in meeting the export challenge, um, so the you know I, I could range a whole I could go across a range of, of of other factors, but I think these are some of the key issues uh, that we have to address, and we have to make sure that the support we put in place is tailored and focused in a fashion that supports companies in achieving these objectives. And we uh, recently were in Perth, and um, we heard some very very positive aspects about uh, how account management firms uh, were being assisted through uh, Scottish Enterprise and uh, a lot of good news about the SDI. But in, in one area there was some concern and that is the, the area of uh, agencies that perhaps uh, fall out with account management uh, criteria uh, and especially within the, the small and medium sized enterprise area. And if uh, from your opening remarks, uh, I noted that you were going to encourage a lot of these uh, companies, small uh, and medium size, who maybe haven't been exporting but have the potential to. What, what assistance can we, can we give them um, to enter into that market? There's a couple of points here that I think are relevant. The, the, the first is that um, on the account management issue, I, I would want to, I think I've, I've made this point to the committee before, but uh, it's a point that, that uh, I, I, I never tire of making, is that the, the account management structure is not um, just available for big companies. It's available for companies of all sizes. So I can think of and have visited you know, two-person companies who are account managed by Scottish Enterprise or HIE. And so they should be because the crucial criteria that they touch is that they are high growth companies with potential. So uh, yeah, I'm constantly testing and challenging Scottish Enterprise that the account management decisions that are made are focused on the companies with growth potential in our economy, not just the big companies uh, within Scotland. And, um, you know, that's not, I'm not going to sit here and say that's uh, absolutely always delivered. It's a source of constant challenge that uh, I'm taking forward with Scottish Enterprise. That's the first point. The second point is that I'm actively considering, and I'm not yet in a position to make any definitive commitments about this, about how we meet some of the challenge that um, Mr Robertson has highlighted of reaching a wider cross-section of the company base who are interested in exporting and international business activity because you know essentially you know companies I think companies I'm pleased to hear the feedback about account management it's the feedback I get around the country where a company is, is account managed they generally feel well served and well supported there is a question that flows from that is are all the right companies getting account managed support and assistance and that's a question that I am now considering very actively because if we want to achieve our export challenges, um, and it's also, it's not just an export challenge, I think we've also got an innovation challenge, I want to make sure that we properly enlist the companies who are prepared to make a commitment to that endeavour. And if they're prepared, the companies are made prepared to make a commitment to that endeavour, then the government and our agencies should be prepared to support them in that process. So there is a, 
you know, I, I, I'm looking at how we most effectively do that, and I'm discussing that with the enterprise agencies, because um, what I am very keen to do is to make sure that if there's a company in Scotland that is prepared to work with us in meeting the innovation and internationalisation challenges that we face as a country, I want to see that company getting its support. So uh, I'll obviously share further information with the committee in due course as I come to conclusions on the meeting of that particular challenge, which I have followed <coughs> the evidence the committee took in, 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 its, in, in, in Perth. I can see exactly where that point was coming from, and it's one that I've been considering for some time. Okay. Um, we, we've seen a very positive example of cooperation and collaboration, say, within Aaron and, and a lot of, sort of small, medium-sized companies coming together, especially within the food and drink uh, sector, to fill a container, which then actually goes to um, some of the five-star hotels in Dubai, for instance. Do you see that example of cooperation, collaboration, being able to be so, uh, used as a template to encourage other small and medium-sized uh, uh, firms um, to to fill the sort of freight uh, containers to, to sort of go to the market? Because that's one of the problems for some of the smaller uh, firms, that they, they just don't have the sufficient capacity um, to fill maybe freight containers. I think that's a, a fabulous practical example. And in the geography of Aaron uh, lends itself to this, where you've got a range of innovative companies, you know, various other geographies. I'm also struck by what I see from the Orkney Isles as well about many of these questions, you know, where geography binds people together very effectively. They find a solution based on their geography and they address it. So I think it's a, a marvellous practical example and um, uh, I'll, I'll certainly um, evangelise about that to my wider communication around the country. The other observation I would make about um, exporting and it relates to some smaller companies one of the points that strikes me about the, the New Start business community in Scotland today is that most of these companies start off and they actually think their market is a global market from day one. Why do they feel that? It's because connectivity is just so readily accessible for them in terms of the, the all of the applications and software that we all have available to us. If I think back to uh, the world I occupied now about, um, let me see, mm, tw 25 years ago when I worked in the field of business development in Glasgow. When you worked with new start businesses 25 years ago, you know, the first thing they did was produce a brochure and they might take that to, you know, once they conquered the Glasgow market, they might conquer the Renfrew market or something like that. Many companies now start off thinking, I'm in Edinburgh, Glasgow, I'm connected to the world through broadband, so... The world is my oyster. And companies are now... So, so as in the thought process of, of startup companies, they're thinking increasingly about global reach in their activities. And I think that's a really welcome process. But we've, we, we've got to get more and more companies involved in, in, in this process and actively engaged in, in what can be taken forward in that respect. So looking at that global reach aspect, I mean, connectivity is incredibly important and, and I'm quite sure we, we all know uh, the, the position of the Scottish Government with regard to APD uh, and how that perhaps is a, a, another barrier uh, within the, the market. But in terms of actually having the appropriate skilled personnel, say in areas uh, like China and the uh, Asian market, because um, one of the criticisms we're hearing about SD, from SDI is that they have generalists in a lot of these uh, offices that have been opened. Are we looking at ensuring that we've got the appropriate skilled people uh, within the, the markets that you're hoping to conquer? I think the, the I think most, I think the, the key issue about you know, having observed the SDI operation in a number of different jurisdictions around the world, um, I think the key lesson I would draw from it is that the, the fundamental requirement of SDI personnel is to be able to confidently and effectively support companies in gaining access to the market. I wouldn't say that I thought the greater priority was them f for them to be a, a, an industry expert. I think the uh, you know, we've got plenty of industry. If I take, for example, one of my trips that I made to Japan, for example, I was accompanied in that trip by the SDI person in Scotland uh, and a Scottish enterprise person also who were experts in life sciences and renewable energy. 
we were you know, shepherded around different con business visits in Japan by our local people on the ground who struck me as being fabulously well connected and aware of the market, sensitive to the market, gave me very, very um, accurate and useful briefings about how I should approach the access to the market. Um, and if we got into a conversation about some sophisticated level of life science activity or renewable activity, I had my industry experts at my side from Scotland who were able to assist me in communicating that message. But crucially, the, the bit that our team on the ground could deliver was quality and informed access to the market. And I do think that's the most important consideration and requirement that we should have on these individuals. Thank you. And maybe last I can be done. Um, the infrastructure and connectivity aspect, um, are, are we, is there enough spend within the infrastructure getting goods to market? For instance, um, there's a lot of criticism that we don't have the real uh, sort of uh, connecting to, say, shipping, for instance, uh, and again, maybe to some of our uh, airports in terms of getting freight out. Um, the capital spend, uh, is there enough going into that to ensure that we join up these areas? Certainly in... in, in well, me members can make a, a judgment about the government's capital spend programmes, but you know, if I, if I look at the infrastructure of Scotland, um, you know, I can see, you know, there are clearly very significant improvements being made. The other week, there I was visiting the um, the Clyde Gateway organisation in the east end of Glasgow, and you know, listening to the implications for that part of Glasgow of the government's decision in partnership with local government to fund the M74 completion project in the um, in the, the east end of Glasgow uh, has led to tremendous uh, an opening up of tremendous economic opportunities for the east end of Glasgow. Um, so, the, the, so clearly our infrastructure spend can, can have that economic impact and it's designed to support a wider range of propositions around the country. I think where I would accept that there are limitations in what we have on offer is about the um, service connectivity. Um, we've we've just gone through. Um, members will be aware of a, the signing just in the last couple of weeks of a memorandum of understanding between the government, Fourth Ports Authority, and um, DFDS, um, the ferry operators, the freight ferry operators from Rosyth, and that's been necessary to support the continuation of a very important freight connection between Scotland and continental Europe. That is our only freight connection, scheduled freight connection, as other vessels obviously make the journey on a, on a, 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 a chartered basis, but as a service connection. And I would concede that that is a limitation for us. And obviously the fact that we've had to get into that discussion with DFDS and with Fourth Ports is an indication of the importance that we attach to connections of that type. Would we like to have more? Most definitely we would like to have more. Um, so I think this is an area that we perhaps need to explore because it will be will be another factor that companies have to wrestle with if it is a complicated and challenging exercise in getting goods to market. Okay. Yep, that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Um, Thank you. Good morning, Captain Mr. McCallum, Mr. Mason. Um, if I may just follow on that particular point, um, I promise I wouldn't mention Spaceport today, and I won't, although I do think we need to get it. Of course I have. And uh, one of the things that does concern me on that, and I know it's much in the future, is that we don't seem to have the team together as Newquay and Cornwall does, so I would ask Cabinet Secretary to encourage Visit Scotland, Scottish Enterprise and other agencies to get together on that. Just, just on the, the air connectivity uh, particularly, I don't know whether you can share anything with us regarding... Uh, what you think might happen in terms of APD, but clearly not, uh, that has a major impact, not just on tourism, but on business tourism uh, in, in terms of uh, bringing, uh, as I've just experienced with some people from China, uh, to, to, uh, to Scotland. But associated with that is also the argument of Dennis Robertson just mentioned about consolidation uh, internally, which, which would help, but also the fact that we are and you mentioned low carbon emissions, that currently Scottish exports are, are consolidated in some cases and are taken down by road to go out in the belly of a, a jumbo jets from Heathrow. I mean, is the, what, what discussions have you had and how has that impacted your budget thinking? First of all, on, on APD, um, 
members will be familiar that are aware that I'm a member of the Smith Commission and I, I have signed a, a Trappist vow of silence on issues being discussed in the Smith Commission. So if, if the committee will forgive me, um, I won't inadvertently incur the wrath of Lord Smith of Kelvin by uh, discussing what's been discussed around that table. But yeah, I'm sure we've got plenty of opportunities to discuss that uh, in the period to come. On the issue of connectivity, uh, obviously we... Um, we are operating a very collaborative approach in relation to trying to secure improved air connectivity routes. Um, we had to put this in place because I would, I think, I would, I would accept that the Scottish combined collaborative proposition wasn't as focused as it should be, and we've put that together. Um, it is. Um, a collaboration involving Scottish Enterprise, HIE, Transport Scotland and Visit Scotland. I think if we look at the, f the fruits of that, um, it's been very successful in 2014. Uh, we have six new routes um, that have opened up in 2014. Edinburgh, Chicago, Edinburgh, Philadelphia, Edinburgh, Doha, Glasgow to the Isle of Man, which I can see is not that far away, but it's still a, still a market. Um, Edinburgh, Abu Dhabi, and Glasgow, Halifax. Um, and, and interestingly, the, the Middle East carriers are reporting an increase in the volume of high-yield Scottish food and drink that is being carried out in the belly of these uh, uh, aircraft, particularly to the Middle East, which is obviously in the Middle East hubs are crucial in terms of reaching um, Asian and Australasian markets. So I think that, uh, so as I look at this issue, um, six extra routes, five of them um, long-haul routes, I think it's pretty good going for 2014 and opens up some new opportunities for Scotland. I do think the point of um, connecting all of that with uh, the export of goods from Scotland is important. And uh, obviously the frequency of these flights is really crucial in securing the export of um, food and drink products, which you know will be crucial to get to these markets. And, and, and again, th this is a cross-government effort. Um, the Rural Affairs Secretary, Richard Lockhead, is very actively involved in the export activity and the promotion of food and drink around the world. I do my bit on the international stage. The First Minister has, has had extensive involvement in this area um, over recent years. Um, so an, a number of us are involved in trying to seize the opportunities to promote Scottish um, products to a wide range of, of, of different markets. And, 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 and there is no doubt that, that, that you know, Scotland has had success but when one looks at I was down in in in, uh, in London just a few weeks ago uh, and if and talking to people who are involved in the transport industry and despite the protestations of the chief executive of Heathrow this morning on GMS you know the infrastructure and, and the cost of building another runway at Heathrow will impact Scotland's tourism and uh, export potentially um, a, 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 you know, either through cost or lack of appropriate infrastructure, never mind uh, carbon emissions. So I think that's uh, something that has to be factored into our discussion. We, we talked about SDI earlier on. SDI and Scottish Enterprise, generally, and the enterprise agencies uh, ha have, been, uh, have been doing a, a good job. But I just wonder, given the emphasis on exports, the SDI budget represents about 10% of the SE budget. And I'd like to ask Mr Mason a question in a minute about Scottish Enterprise budget. Um, uh, or, or finances. Should we be uh, ensuring that Scottish Enterprise spend more of their budget, not necessarily creating specialists, but uh, increasing the allocations uh, and increasing their 10% of the Scottish Enterprise budget? I think the... the obviously, a judgment's got to be made here within the wider um, finances, and that I'll... I'll I'm very happy to answer questions on the SE budget as well. Um, Mr Mason may have to help me out, but uh, I'll happily answer them into the bargain. Um, we, 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 you know, the government has to make a judgment about um, the balance of its public expenditure across the whole gambit of expenditure, and that ultimately will determine how much money is available globally for Scottish Enterprise and HIE budgets. And um, clearly, you know, I, I, I take 
those decisions um, across the government uh, and apply them in my own portfolio. And within that, a reasonable balance has got to be struck between what we spend on external promotion and um, you know, market activity through SDI and what is deployed supporting the company base in Scotland. I would caution against viewing the SDI budget as the sum total of what we actually spend on trying to establish our export presence. Because what account managers are doing with individual companies in Scotland will be invaluable in persuading those companies to take the steps to get involved in international activity when they can then get access to the international network that we put forward through SDI. So um, I, I think, you know, obviously there are judgments to be made about the right sort of quantum of resources to be available, but that that uh, that's how I would consider we use those resources and how we use them effectively to try to encourage Scottish companies to be involved in international markets. Uh, yesterday I convened uh, the cross-party group on social enterprise, and one of the questions that was raised was, was uh, internationalisation of social enterprises, or some of them. Uh, and, and I was surprised by the desire by social enterprises who now tend to see themselves different from the third sector, which is very important, as, as is highlighted in the budget, in terms of uh, supporting welfare uh, reform and activities. But uh, how do you perceive the role in the overall enterprise area of social enterprises? And going forward, should we be looking at a different budget because of their enterprise activities and hopefully their international activities? Mr. Brody spends a, a, has a great deal of focus on, on the social enterprise field in Scotland, so he has um, has had to endure um, many of my speeches on the issues of social enterprise. And one of the points that I made at the Social Enterprise Awards just the other week there in Parliament, I'm not sure if Mr. Brody was there, but the point I made was that I welcomed the fact that Scottish Enterprise were a sponsor of the... Um, Social Enterprise Awards and were involved in the the judging of so, uh, social enterprises for these awards because I want social enterprises to have access to as much business development advice as the wider company base of Scotland. They are businesses. They're businesses of a different character, but they're businesses that are entitled to business development advice. I would be I, I'd be reluctant to create separate budget lines for social enterprise business support because I generally take the view that business development should be the forte of Scottish enterprise and HIE, that we shouldn't have that fragmented. I was, uh, you know, I, I made it quite clear in the past that I was um, against, for example, a business development role being given to Creative Scotland um, because I felt that would um, I was perfectly happy for artistic organisations and, and, and artistic companies to have account managed and business development support uh, from Scottish Enterprise, but I wanted that to come from um, a, a very strong business development base. Uh, so for that reason, I, would be, I, I wouldn't be keen on a separate budget line, but what I would be keen on is making sure, and I make this point, and it's fulfilled by Scottish Enterprise, and I, again, it's a source of challenge by me to the organisation, to ensure that Scottish Enterprise is giving business development advice and support to social enterprises within Scotland, because I view social enterprises as fundamental to broadening the economic and industrial base of Scotland. Thank you. And last question, if I may. Yeah. Uh, and I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's <coughs> a great support for social enterprises. Um, there's no question that the government's economic strategy is well thought out, well founded. Uh, and addressed, and I think associated with that is is, is uh, obviously the financial stewardship that's existed over the past few years. Uh, but it would be unusual for me not to do uh, one element of carping. We just talked about social uh, Scottish enterprise. Scottish enterprise has a net worth of 514 million pounds, according to its accounts. Um, I just wonder if. You're happy that Scottish Enterprise follows the government's economic strategy because they've just written off 1.3 million to a social network site uh, on sport, 
and have just offered 2.7 million in RSAs to a London-centric one-stop shop for accountancy and insurance. I just, is there proper engagement in terms of following that strategy? Or should they be following that strategy? Oh, yes, is the short answer to that question. There's, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind. And I think if the chairman of Scottish Enterprise would, was here, um, he would say to you very clearly that he understands his mandate. If I look at the, my letter of direction, which I send annually to Scottish Enterprise and HIE, um, you know, that, you know, one could not read that letter and think anything other than the organisations are being directed to follow the government's economic strategy. And I would, you know, I'd, I'd obviously, and that's just a given for me, uh, in, individual investment decisions uh, are clearly not taken by government, they're taken by Scottish Enterprise. I expect them to be taken within the context of the, uh, the government's economic strategy. And, um, uh, you know, I don't seek to interfere in the individual operational decisions that Scottish Enterprise takes in that respect, other than to say that the organisation must have a compelling basis for justifying that, ex that, that, that investment, which I know are issues that the committee have raised with them and have tested the, the, the organisation on. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm conscious of the time and I've got three more members who I need to, to get in. Um, start with uh, Richard Baker. I'll try and be um, quite succinct. Um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, obviously you'll be aware that of the importance of the oil and gas sector, um, not only to its um, contribution to our economy, but in terms of exports as well. So I want to ask just a couple of questions on the submission we've had um, to the draft budget from Oil and Gas UK. They say their members have a view that the landscape for export support is cluttered and they can be unclear which department or agency to go to. Is that a comment you recognise or think is fair or um, what do you think needs to be done to ensure that these um, businesses who hopefully will be growing their export uh, activities know exactly where to go to get the help they need? I think it's pretty clear that um, any company that wishes support can engage with Scottish Enterprise um, uh, who are connected um, very directly to um, Scottish Development International, who act on behalf of all of Scotland, um, and the necessary support and opportunities um, can be made available to companies to enable that to happen. So within a Scottish context, I don't think there's any lack of clarity at all. Um, take, take your view on that. And you mentioned um, support that industries need to um, uh, not only sustain their um, activity in the North Sea, but also to increase exports. One of the issues uh, which UK oil and gas um, also um, uh, highlight is the scarcity of skilled labour. Now, clearly, in terms of addressing skills gap, the further education sector has got a key role uh, to play, particularly sure as you were at Aberdeen uh, College, the work they do to, in um, schemes to train up workers for the oil and gas industry. So given the, the importance of um, providing those skilled workers for the industry to maintain activity in the North Sea and to increase exports, you know, is, isn't a, a real terms cut to the FE budget risking undermining that work we hope that these uh, businesses will carry out? Uh, no, um, I, I have to wrestle with um, a real terms reduction in the government's budget. So, uh, you know, regrettably, there will be um, there will be real terms reductions in budgets um, within government. The FE budget um, is going from five hundred and twenty-two million pounds to five hundred and twenty-six million pounds. So it's going up in cash terms, uh, except there's erosion in real terms. Um, but the government's budget is being eroded in real terms, and I think. Uh, you know, if, if we're giving a commitment to, for example, give a real terms increase to the health service, we'll have, you know, in a budget that's reducing in real terms, there'll be implications across the board. Um, you, we, we've, we've gone, we've had extensive discussion um, around the funding of further education in recent years. Um, I believe the, the, the education, and I support entirely, uh, the steps the education secretary has taken to reform the college sector. I think anybody... Um, observing the college sector, and certainly I hear lots of commentary about this now, believes the reform programme has been necessary and successful and has improved and strengthened the college sector. Um, I think there's two final observations I would make. Um, one is that I believe it to be absolutely essential that the college sector is focused on supporting individuals uh, in the world of work so that um, the connections with industry are uh, are, are, are critical to ensuring that uh, the college sector is properly 
attuned to the requirements of the of, of the labour market. Um, and finally, um, the investment we've made in the Energy Skills Academy in the North East of Scotland, which was an initiative that came out of the four educational institutions in the North East uh, of Scotland, has been particularly um, helpful in this respect. And I think it's also um, been a, a sort of trailblazer for the, 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 the regional um, college model that is now the norm across the rest of Scotland. Okay. Okay. Brief supplementary from Dennis Roberts. Uh, thank you. Uh, it, it really just to, to say that uh, do you believe that the industry themselves has a role to play in actually sort of fulfilling that gap of the skills sector? I, if I believe um, Sareen Wood actually I think, made that point in his report. Um, y yes, I, I think the, the industry has a role to play um, and the industry working to, together with government um, will, will have a very strong combined beneficial effect in addressing these issues. And one of the points which I would um, reinforced to the committee today, which is central to the whole area of skills, is that there is sufficient industry engagement in designing what skills development we require to undertake. And that was a, a main point out of Sir Ian Wood's report to the Scottish Government on skills uh, in, 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 in the younger workforce. It was also a point that Sir Ian made in his report to the United Kingdom government on oil and gas. Uh, and, and it's a, a point that um, certainly leads to a great deal of frustration on my part that industry isn't always as close to, in, uh, to influencing the decisions about what are our educational institutions concentrating on because the f to, to get that focus right to support to, uh, individuals in the world of work is, in my view, crucial in this area of policy. Okay, Joe McAlpin. Thank you very much, convener. And can I apologise for missing your opening comments, Cabinet Secretary? Um, I was pleased to hear you talk about um, uh, closing the gap between large enterprises and, uh, and small and medium enterprises in terms of the support that they got from Scottish Enterprise and the Account Managed Network. Um, I wanted to talk about regional disparities in that. Um, when Scottish Enterprise... Um, were in front of the committee in Perth. I did highlight to them that uh, the total account managed exporters uh, in Dumfries and Galloway, in my region, is 1.8%. Um, that compares to 20% uh, for total account managed exporters in, say, Edinburgh and the Lothians. Now, you wouldn't expect Dumfries and Galloway to be on a par with Edinburgh and the Lothians, but it is the lowest and it's substantially behind other rural, a rural areas, and I wondered if um, you shared my concerns that perhaps um, the, the, there were too many regional disparities across Scotland in terms of the level of uh, support that they get. I think that, well, the, the, the statistics um, that Joe McCarpen and Reese are, 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 are accurate, what, what I have in front of me is that the number of growth exporters in Dufferin and Galloway um, um, is 18. The percentage of total AC growth exporters is 1.8, but the percentage, of <coughs> but the percentage of total growth companies in the area, that represents 51. So you know, I I, I quite understand the the 1.8 figure causes um, a degree of a degree of concern, but I think looked at in the context of the total growth companies in the area, it's um, slightly more comprehensible. Having said that. I come back to the point I made earlier on, which is about the, um, ensuring that we're talking to the right growth companies. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think one of my the issues that I repeatedly raise with Scottish Enterprise is to make sure that we are actually um, canvassing the company base of Scotland effectively to see where the growth potential will exist. And there may be, in Dumfries and Galloway, relatively small enterprises who have fabulous growth potential, who would benefit from growth support from Scottish Enterprise, and in my opinion, and according to the government strategy, they are, if they have that, those characteristics, they're as entitled to receive that support as any other country in any other part, uh, any other company in any other part of the, com of the country. So I think ensuring that that um, focus is properly taken forward by Scottish Enterprises is an important part of the, uh, the work that's taken forward. 
And the other thing I would add to that is that um, I'm a, you know, I've followed the, the, the question that Joel McAlpin has, has made of Scottish Enterprise on this question. I, I meet uh, a couple of times a year with the South of Scotland Alliance, which is a combination of the local authorities, the Scottish Borders Council and the Fish and Galloway Council, and Scottish Enterprise and some other public bodies. And in the course of those discussions over the, 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 the last few years, I've picked up a sense that, there was, that, that they would like to have, they would like to feel on the receiving end of more attention from Scottish Enterprise. I think there's a, a sense that in the south of Scotland, um, there isn't a, 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 a dedicated economic development agency as there is in the Highlands and Islands, and that's a product of, of history. What came out of that was my invitation to the South of Scotland Alliance to essentially formulate um, a proposition for better and more effective engagement with Scottish enterprise on a shared agenda to improve economic performance in the South of Scotland. That's now uh, emerged. Uh, I've received that, and that's the source. That will be the source of ongoing discussion with the South of Scotland Alliance to ensure that we deliver properly and fully the range of economic development assistance that's required in the south of Scotland. Well, I welcome that. That's uh, that's very encouraging. There is a there is a sense that the reorganisation um, a number of years ago of Scottish Enterprise, while it worked in other places, ha has not worked in the south of Scotland, and that. Certainly in the southwest of Scotland, it's seen as not working. Um, and it, your, the development plan also mentions your ongoing commitment to NPF3. So NPF3, I had a number of conversations with the planning minister about it. Um, the, the development plan is based on city regions. The southwest of Scotland is the only part of Scotland that doesn't fall into a city region, so therefore it's out with that policy framework. And again, it, it, one could say, for example, the borders is part of Edinburgh city region, it's another part of the south of Scotland, but the southwest is not. And do you see that as a problem? Well, I think there's, there's, there, there's a couple of very significant points in here. The first is that um, the conversations I've had through the South of Scotland Alliance, and it's, it's been a very helpful conversation, um, I think has got us to a position where some of the inherent concerns that, um, that Joe McCarpin has raised um, are able now to be addressed by the formulation of this joint proposition uh, which has emerged. And I can give the assurance that this will attract my personal attention to make sure that those issues are properly addressed for the second reason, which is that in the government's economic strategy and in our national performance framework, we have, um, we have commitments around um, regional equity. And the meaning of regional equity is that no part of Scotland should be left out of the process of economic development and economic renewal. Um, so I have to make sure that that is as felt as strongly in the south of Scotland and particularly in Dumfries and Galloway on the issues raised by Joe McAlpine, as it's felt in central Edinburgh. And, um, a, a, and making sure that we have um, appropriate interventions um, in place around the country uh, is essential to, 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 to realise that. In NPF3, um, I don't have NPF3 in front of me, but from my recollection, there will be a number of strategic developments in the southwest of Scotland. I'd be very surprised if Cairn Ryan, etc., weren't involved in that. I'd be a bit surprised if the Crichton campus wasn't. But that you're talking about the 14 national developments across Scotland as part of NPF3. Yes. Well, there aren't any in the south of Scotland. They're not, Scotland. right, okay. I'd, I'd um, be surprised about the... Let me, let me explore the point about... I'd, I'd be surprised about that Cairn Ryan doesn't attract a certain amount of um, significance in the NPF3, but I'd better go and check my knowledge Cairn of Ryan that Cairn Ryan did, but it's been taken off, and right, I asked okay. for the Crichton campus to be included, but it didn't meet the criteria, apparently. Okay. Um, 
I think there is, a, I'm totally welcome what you're saying and the personal interest that you're taking in it, but isn't there a contradiction, an inevitable contradiction when you go for the critical mass that a growth strategy brings? So you, you back growth companies and they're in growth areas and that encourages more finance, um, whereas in an area which is suffering, um, that doesn't have that growth, doesn't have the connectivity, it doesn't therefore attract as much of the as much of the support if your whole support is based on the critical math, mass of growth? The support is not based on the critical mass of growth. The support is based on where we believe in the company base there is growth potential. So, uh, and what I want to reassure the committee about is the fact that that judgment is not just made about um, uh, companies in city regions, it's made about companies of length and breadth of Scotland. Um, and, you know, what that will, um, and that will, that that has to include the, the the south of Scotland as much as it has to include any other part of Scotland, uh, for the for the simple reason that the commitments that we have given and the tasks we've set ourselves on the question of regional equity are um, absolutely crucial to be fulfilled because we cannot, you know, it just is not acceptable for us to have growth in Scotland that excludes significant parts of our country. And that's 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 at odds with the government's economic strategy. It's at odds with the national performance framework. So we um, we have an obligation to, to look at those issues and to uh, put in place the necessary mechanisms to address them. Um, that work is underway with the, um, through the work of the strategic forum that I chair that brings together the enterprise agencies with the funding council who will be heavily involved in the current campus um, issues um, to ensure that that's properly reflected in the economic priorities that we take forward. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. Now, I'm conscious we are running a little bit short of time. About two members want to come in on, on tourism, which is an area we've not uh, touched on at all yet. And I'll start with Marco Piaggi. Thank you, Convener. One of the areas that came up in evidence with Visit Scotland was the importance of investment in business tourism, bringing conferences to Scotland. And there's also a a very strong thread of, of events-related uh, work as well. You referred earlier to the, the impact of creating the new air routes on uh, food exports and so on. Is there, well, to what extent is there now evidence from the, the business-related work from the, the export promotion that these events and conferences and uh, that strand of Visit Scotland's work is generating new business for Scotland as well? Well, the, the, I think this is an area of... Um of, of great interest and, it, uh, and has delivered significant returns. Um, we, we have had in place um, the conference um, bid fund, which um, was of a fairly modest investment of three million pounds. Um, and it's been instrumental in um, bringing into the country um, 107 million pounds worth of activity. So you know, you put in three and you get 107 back out is a pretty good rate of return. Uh, <laughs> I could do with a few more rates of return like that. Um, so it, it, we recognise this to be a very significant factor in in what we take forward. Um, and again, this has been responded to by the private sector. You know, the SSE Hydro. In Glasgow, if I just single that out as one particular um, uh, venue, now has the capacity to to um, put on all sorts of performance, not least from the Deputy First Minister in a couple of weeks' time, but from other international stars into the bargain, which gives people a reason to travel substantial distances to come to see particular performances and the spillover effect into accommodation and spending power is very significant. Now, of course, the government has been involved and Scottish Enterprise have been heavily involved in supporting the development of that venture, but it's taken private sector capital and leadership and it's a great asset for us to have in Scotland. So I think that the conference market is one of um, very significant potential. We will be wanting to sustain um, our presence in that area. It's a very competitive market, but we've got very, but we've got a very competitive proposition. And, and obviously, the more these events happen, the more frequently there is a 
footfall that is coming into Scotland on this bit, the more the justification is there for direct air connections and other transport connections that can be beneficial in that respect. So I, I, I see this as a crucial tool in expanding our, 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 our tourism presence. In terms of the, the knock-on effect, it's, it's one thing to spend three million pounds, get 107 million pounds back in conferences, and that's a great return. It would be an even better return if that was then leading to people coming from around the world, coming to Scotland, making business links here, and then starting to trade with Scotland. For example, I, I believe that's a major feature of the work around the, the Ryder Cup. So, so in your work, either abroad on trade missions or, or with Scottish enterprises, is this something that we're starting to see coming through? Well, yes, and the, if, if you take this, this year has been an, you know, an absolutely bumper year for people having a reason to come to Scotland which can give us a platform for business development conversations, um, um, principally around the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup. These are two huge events. Scottish Enterprise deployed very significant resources and 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 and, and, and people. You know, this is you know, lots of staff working all the hours that God sent, weekends and all the rest of it, to make sure that uh, you know, I took part in a number of different events with Scottish Enterprise aimed at business development purposes. And from that will come a whole range of leads that will be followed up in due course. So I wouldn't want in any way members to think that our approach to um, the pipeline of business development connections is anything other than a sustained contact network that is um, pursued um, to secure those business benefits for Scotland. And if it happens to be that somebody comes here because of the Edinburgh Book Festival or the Commonwealth Games or the Ryder Cup or whatever it happens to be, they will be followed up in a fashion to secure business connections. And uh, lastly, Visit Scotland described themselves as pleased uh, with the budget they had. I think that's stakeholder for ecstatic given how, uh, how, how uh, not forward people are when they come to talk about these things. In particular, there was a point that uh, they have £5 million more to spend on marketing than they had expected. Is that something that you would recognise? And what is the, the thinking behind that in terms of maintaining their funding at that level? Well, at the, at, at, at the end of the um, opening ceremony for the Junior Ryder Cup in, in Blue Gowrie Golf Club, uh, the chairman of Visit Scotland was there and I, I just observed to him that uh, the weather forecast was fabulous for the Ryder Cup and it, along with that would mean that Scotland would look wonderful uh, to the international audience um, on television for that. Uh, it had looked wonderful during the Commonwealth Games. It had looked wonderful on many, many live broadcasts that I saw from the referendum campaign. So there really would be no need for him to have any extra money for his marketing campaign. So he didn't take that terribly well, um, just given his protestations to me over some time. In a, in a case well marshalled, I have to say, by the Board of Visits Scotland, of the case for them to have additional marketing support. And I'm, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'll tell him that, that Mr Biagi's interpretation is that he should be ecstatic about his £5 million. Pounds. I'm not sure he'll necessarily... <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, I'll, 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 I'll just assume that he's ecstatic then when he, when he next comes to knock my door for more money. But I think the my impression, well, it's not my impression, the evidence of the Visit Scotland marketing activity is that it, is, um, it delivered a very significant economic return to Scotland. So it's money well spent. And I think the quality of the marketing campaigns that are undertaken. The Surprise Yourself campaign, I thought, was a, a beautiful, beautiful presentation of Scotland. Um, and uh, so, I, so essentially, I, I took a decision in a tight spending round to allocate more resources than I had planned to allocate to visit Scotland to try to give the organisation the opportunity to build on what's been um, a fabulous year of promotion of Scotland, an awful lot of it you know, we didn't have to, well, we didn't have to pay for through the Visit Scotland marketing budget, we had to pay for it from various other budgets, but uh, nonetheless, um, Scotland looked great in 2014 to a world audience, and we need to continue to sustain that, and uh, that's the purpose, and I'm very confident, I have great confidence in the marketing activities of Visit Scotland uh, to use that money uh, wisely and effectively. Uh, Follow-up from Richard Baker. No? 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 Fine. Um, I, 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 yeah.
Yes. Um, uh, how important then, uh, Cabinet Secretary, is the promotion of Brand Scotland uh, in in the potential of opening up the export market um, uh, globally? Oh, we, we've. For, for a whole variety of reasons, um, Commonwealth Games, Ryder Cup, referendum, Scotland has been in the news like we have never been in the news across the world. And, um, you know, television audiences for the Ryder Cup of 500 million homes is really quite extraordinary. And frankly, the country could not have looked more magnificent than it did um, uh, for those uh, in in that in that event, as was the case during the, the referendum, as I, uh, and also Commonwealth Games, as, as I've said. So, the, the the impression that I think the wider world will have achieved of Scotland over the course of 2014 will have been a good and strong and profound one. We can't just say, well, that's the job done. We don't need to continue to reinforce that. The tourism market is an intensely competitive market, so therefore we need to continue to to fuel that. And also in the business development market, uh, obviously the presence of SDI is very strong in um, a, in uh, promoting the reasons why Scotland should be uh, a destination for investment. That's across a whole variety of different reasons. It's not just about uh, the topography and the geography and the scenery of Scotland. It is also about the inherent strength, the economic strength, the skill base, the educational capability and the inventiveness of the Scottish population, and these are values upon which we uh, we trade very strongly. Okay, thank you. I think that uh, concludes our session, just slightly slightly over time. But on the committee's behalf, I want to thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and your colleagues for coming along. Uh, it's been very helpful, and we will now need to consider our budget report. Uh, and on that point, uh, we will have a short suspension and go into private session. <laughs>